Okay, so we are going to be talking about voting rights now. You guys all should have completed the hyperdoc that went through nonviolent and violent protests, and you guys talked about the Black Panthers and so forth, and talked about different nonviolent movements as well, too, such as sit ins and the Freedom Rides. And at the end of that, you then learned about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, which was monumental legislation that was passed that ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination on the base of race or color and etc. Um, and all this, although this was great and um, definitely a step forward for African Americans, there was the issue of voting rights. And without having the right to vote, they would not be able to enact change. Um, and so after the violent attacks on the Freedom Riders back in 1961, Robert Kennedy actually started to tell African Americans they need to focus their uh, programs on voter registration. They need to get people registered to vote in order to enact change because the vote was going to be the key in order to have the South change their ways. Um, so they have been continuing to do that throughout the 60s. In 1962, they um, instigated what is known as the Voter Education Project in which they were trying to educate African Americans so they would be able to pass things such as that literacy test. But they soon realized that opposition to black suffrage is just as strong as the opposition was to desegregation. And so they are going to have some troubles down in the South, especially in the areas of Mississippi and Alabama. They also led some marches to try to register voters and when they marched to the courthouse to try to get registered and so forth. But they are going to be proven to be just as brutal and violent as the other marches that we had talked about um, during the um, acts to try to get desegregation passed. And so uh, we'll be talking about Selma today and other examples um, of attempts to try to get voter registration for African Americans. Here you can see you have some African Americans lined up trying to register to vote. Some of those things that were prohibiting African Americans to vote were those very first things that we talked about. You guys saw a clip about um, Oprah in the movie Selma, and that was literacy tests. You guys took that literacy test and saw how difficult that was to pass. Also, poll taxes, having to pay before even voting, and African Americans don't really have the money to, in order to pay that poll tax. Also, the grandfather clause, which mostly um, was successful for whites be, uh, because their grandfathers were able to vote. However, in the case of African Americans, that hindered them. And so um, these three things were the main things that were prohibiting African Americans to vote. And even if they pat, like they were able to pass that literacy test, a lot of times they were stopped at the registration offices because the whites that were running those offices uh, just didn't want them to be able to register to vote. And so um, with the Voter Education Act, um, they are trying to promote people getting registered, be someone, vote, and, um, or the Voter Education Project, excuse me. Uh, but they are trying to get more African Americans educated so that more African Americans can go register to vote. Um, and so we're going to start off by talking about the problems in Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi's in the Deep South and proved to be the greatest challenge to try to get African Americans in order to vote. 40% of the population in Mississippi was African American. So almost half the entire population of the state was African Americans. And like less than 3% of these people were even able to register to vote. And they are not being represented within their state governments. So African Americans were constantly living in fear that they were going to be killed. If they tried to go and register, their names would be put in the paper, the KKK would be informed, more than likely they would disappear, be lynched and killed. Um, but in spite of all this, the voter education project was semi-successful. Um, they were able to get 3.5 out of 5 million blacks in the South registered to vote. But Mississippi, as I said, had the most discouraging results. We're going to talk about a couple of situations that happened in Mississippi. Um, and then, you know, that sets fear in everyone else. Like if they're trying to do this, they may be killed. And so let's talk about some of those issues here. Um, one thing that was passed that did kind of help um, voter registration down in the South was the 24th Amendment in which banned that poll tax um, that would, you know, they would have to pay in order to vote. They banned that. There's no more poll taxes. It banned states from taxing citizens to vote. Um, however, the problem was is that this only applied to elections for the president and Congress. This does not apply to elections that deal with the state um, or any positions within your local governments and so forth. And so many southern states still use the poll tax to keep people 
from voting. You can bet Mississippi was one of those states. And as the amendment went through the ratification process, civil rights movements were being planned in Mississippi and trying to advocate that this amendment should apply to local and state government elections as well. You can see here um, African Americans are protesting. It says, let our parents register. These are children saying we need free elections. Um, so not only were the adults involved in protests, but you're also seeing teenagers and children also involved in these protests and allowing people to vote. They knew the importance of it as well, too. When the 24th Amendment became constitutional in 1964 and prohibited those poll taxes in federal elections, Colleges started to call upon their students to help with voter registration in Mississippi. Um, and there were thousands of college kids, white college kids, um, especially from Ohio, uh, that went down into Mississippi and are going to help train African Americans in order to register to vote. Um, and they would educate them, not only in reading, but in math as well, too, in African American history and so forth. So they knew what their rights were. But this whole project to go down, like these northerners going down south to help train these people, is called Freedom Summer. And although these northern students are, you know, they're excited, they're ready to go, a lot of them were kind of clueless on what was actually going down south. A lot of people said, you know, like they were excited, but we tried to warn them of what is going to happen and what is the possibility um, of going down south there. But this whole project is known as Freedom Summer, in which they uh, were trained to register voters and teach schools at Freedom Summer. So you have Freedom Schools as well, too. Down in Mississippi, schools spent around $82 on a white student and $22 on a black student. Um, and so this opportunity offered black students the much needed help that they needed in reading and writing and math. And as I talked about black history and civil rights uh, movement as well too. However, the guy who was in charge of this project, which was Robert Moses, he really honestly had one goal and that was getting everyone through the summer alive and making sure that his students and the volunteers were staying safe. However, that is not necessarily going to be the case. You can see here, um, you know, people are protesting, register to vote in the literacy tests. And you can see here's a Freedom School. This was, this was part of the Freedom Summer project um, in which they were trying to educate African Americans. And here you can see there's a, there's a white student there um, helping educate um, African Americans and you know, hopefully helping them register to vote as well too. more students that are involved in the Freedom Summer Project. So June 20th, volunteers started to arrive in Mississippi. Now, um, as we talked about, their goal was to get everyone out of Mississippi alive, but unfortunately this goal is not going to be successful. The very first day that students are sent down to Mississippi, there are going to be students killed by members of the KKK. So on June 20th, they started to arrive in Mississippi. Andrew Grumman, um, along with two other core workers, went to check out a church that had been previously bombed. So they went to go see about this church and like what they could do to help rebuild the church. Um, is it viable and so forth? And so on their way back from checking out the church, uh, they were arrested, be arrested for speeding in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Um, and they necessarily weren't speeding, but they were trying to find any sort of excuse in order to arrest these people. Um, and so they arrested them and then they put them in jail and they held them until that evening. Um, it's important to realize that they held them until the evening so it would be dark out when they did release um, these three people. Now, when they were, were released that night, um, they were never seen again. So the last time that they were uh, spotted was at the um, jail and then they were released and they would never be seen again. Um, and these three people are going to die by the KKK. And so what ends up happening is when they are released from the jail, um, they are tailed by these white supremacists. They were members of the KKK. They followed them and pulled them over. They took them from their car. They brought them to a different area. So they left their car there and brought them to a different area. They shot them and then they buried them under this dam that was being built and so that no one would ever think to look at this dam that was away from where the car was. Then they went back, they burned their car and shoved it into this swamp um, and so they tried to leave no evidence behind uh, that these three had disappeared. Now, 
after this is said and done, you know, they, they, you know, there's this manhunt for these three students who had just disappeared, who were all part of the Freedom uh, Summer Project, but the state wasn't going to do anything. The state acted like they didn't care. The state wasn't putting any sort of investigation into place. And so President Johnson actually has to send the FBI down to Mississippi to figure out what happened um, with, to those three men. And in August, their bodies were found near a dam in Philadelphia. This was because they were tipped off uh, by anonymous source that the uh, sheriff and other members of the community were involved in the disappearance of these three students. So it set a gloom over Freedom Summer because the very first day this is what happens. Uh, many returned home, others endured the harsh violence throughout the entire summer. Here are the pictures of, or here's the picture of the three men that were uh, that had disappeared and were killed by the KKK. They do find out eventually that it was the sheriff and several other members, because the sheriff was a part of the KKK as well too, but several other members of the community um, that were all KKK members. Um, you can see these are the three that had disappeared. And so um, the FBI arrested 21 suspects. All were KKK members, as I said. Eventually seven were convicted and sent to prison. There wasn't I mean, although they were convicted and sent to prison, they were not there, sent there for life. Um, they eventually did get out. But the results of Freedom Summer uh, were that they taught 3,000 students, 17,000 applied to vote. However, out of that 17,000, only 1,600 were accepted. And so it shows with all this work and all this effort, the federal government is really going to need to get involved in order for anything to change in Mississippi. So here are the people that were um, arrested for suspicion of involvement during this. Um, there is a movie about this, very good movie. It's a little bit older, it's from the 80s. Um, it's called Mississippi Burning with Gene Hackman and William Defoe, and it's about these two federal agents that go down to Mississippi to try to solve this murder. It does a good job of depicting what actually happened. Um, and it shows like no one wanted to even help them because if they were known for helping these FBI agents, um, they would be killed themselves as well too by the KKK. Um, so it was a difficult case to crack because everyone was scared uh, for their lives at this moment. Now, along with you know trying to go down and educate the people and getting those people registered, they're also trying to do some organization within politics. You know, African Americans were not allowed to join the Mississippi Democratic Party, and they felt that that was, um, you know, that was against their rights. They should have representation within their government, um, and so they're going to try to a movement in order to get more African Americans represented represented within the Democratic Party. The SCLC and King, remember, the SCLC is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and King. Was, the, um, was in charge of that. They promised to stop protesting during the 1964 election. Um, King and President Johnson were communicating with one another um, in order to work together. But the SNCC, which is the um, other group that was a civil rights group, um, they wanted to protest segregation within the Democratic Party itself. And so they are going to form what is known as the MFDP, which is the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Um, and they want to participate in the Democratic National Convention. They think it's not fair that the Democratic Party is segregated and that there are no African Americans in the Democratic Party. And so they're creating their own party um, in which to get representation. Now they are going to have to decide which delegates they would elect to represent Mississippi, and they're going to elect this woman named Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and here they are at the Democratic National Convention. They were able to get representation. There's Fannie Lou Hamer there. She's one of the representatives of the M or Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And you can see this is a quote by Fannie Lou Hamer. It says, all of this on account of us wanting to register, to become first-class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human, human beings in America? And so she wants the... Um, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to be seated at the Democratic National Convention. Now, Johnson then is going to compromise with the um, MFDP, and they actually give the MFDP two seats. Um, although it is a little compromise, they are getting a little ground. They're not necessarily um, happy with it, and um, but it is they're making slow 
progress. So we're now moving on to the Voting Rights Act um, of 1965, and this is going to follow after um, all these acts going on in Mississippi and so forth, and like, you know what, we need to do something to get, um, get somewhere with voting rights. And it's all going to start in Selma, Alabama. Now, they choose Alabama first off. There was, you know, the catalyst that gets all this going was a bombing at a Birmingham church in which four little girls um, died in this church. Uh, that day it was a Baptist church in Birmingham and so you know King kind of turns his attention to Alabama and um, they're going to start putting on this campaign for voting rights. Now in 1965 King had began, you know, was called down there by the people of Alabama or Selma, excuse me, and um, he is going to start organizing marches in Selma. At that point, 2,000 had been arrested, but the police did not want to give King the confrontation that he was seeking. They know that if they arrest King, all the um, newspapers and you know, the media and so forth are going to flee down there and um, want to see what is going on and what's happening there. And so they look like the bad guys when they're the ones arresting uh, Martin Luther King and these people that are just protesting peacefully. Um, now, he actually, Dr. King was beat by um, an activist that was going against them. Uh, the police did arrest the guy that who um, beat Dr. King um, and left Dr. King alone, obviously. And so Dr. King then basically is kind of forced the police to arrest him. He breaks some uh, traffic laws. And, um, and then also he, they arrest several children that are with him as well, too, to get the effect that he wanted. And it worked. He was put in jail, and the national media swarmed down to Selma, and the masses of children being, you know, because the children were marching as well, too, to the courthouse trying to get, um, trying to get uh, registered, or their parents registered. And this was all over television. So you can see here are some of the children there that are trying to get registered. Now, um, during that time, while King was in prison, several other marches were continuing to happen on the courthouse. And the guy that was in charge um, of the police over there was Jim Clark. Jim Clark was like a bull conner. He was this horrible police chief, and he was uh, very much against rights for African Americans. And he is going to... Um, be African Americans. He's going to arrest them and put them in jail. And in one instance, there was a group that was um, protesting at night. They had, were marching to the courthouse and they turned off all the street lights on these people. And then the police just started attacking them in the dark. And um, one one person, Jimmy Lee Jackson, was with his elderly mother, and um, they raced and tried to flee into this little restaurant where the police um, chased them and actually beat Jimmy Lee Jackson to death. So now someone has died in these Selma marches. And King then announces that he is going to lead a march to Selma, to Montgomery, to the capital of Alabama, to protest to Governor Wallace um, police brutality in response to the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson. And the governor warned that this would not be tolerated, this would cause chaos on the streets, and that any march to Montgomery would be stopped by the state of Alabama. Here's Jimmy Lee Jackson here. He was the sole provider for his family who were very, very, very poor. He was the only educated one. And he is beat to death in a restaurant. Um, supposedly, the police officer said that he was trying to go for his gun, um, but that necessarily is not true. And he was beat to death. He was sent to the hospital but could not be saved. So when Dr. King does get released from prison or from jail, um, he is going to announce this march on Montgomery, not only to protest police brutality, but to protest um, the discrimination of voter registration in Alabama. Here's Governor George Wallace. So here's the governor of Alabama. He will later run for the, in a presidential election, gets much support of the South, but other than that, doesn't get much support. But he's your governor of Alabama. He is completely against rights for African Americans. He is not going to let this march continue. And here's police chief Jim Clark. He had been known for treating African Americans very violently. He was arresting them by the hundreds of trying to march on the courthouse in order to get registered. 
Now, the Selma March was um, going to happen on March 7th, 1965. This was a 54 mile march all the way to Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and when the group of civil rights activists start to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the city and state police block their way. They were sitting down at the bottom of the bridge on their horses in their baby blue uniforms, and they avoided the arrival of these civil rights activists on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The Edmund Pettus Bridge is the famous bridge that they are going to cross in order to have to get out of Selma. You can see the bridge here, um, here where it says the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and you can see the civil rights activists are coming down here, um, and there are your city and state troopers ready um, to invoke violence on the activists. Dr. King was actually not present there the very, very first march um, because he was warned that it could get very violent, and so he actually decided to stay. He was not there for the first march. Here is where they are marching, so it's around 53 miles from Selma to Montgomery. You can see the distance there between the two, and they are going to walk all the way there. Now, when the activists start to cross the line, the first the police warned them to turn around, and they knew what their right was. They were going to march to Montgomery, but the governor was in, um, Sheriff Jim Clark was not going to allow that to happen. Actually, Jim Clark, I forgot to mention, that morning said any white man over the age of 18 come down to the police station and get deputized in order to protect um, their city. And so anyone could get deputized, and these men were carrying um, metal rods, they were carrying clubs, they were carrying chains, they were carrying whips, they were carrying electric cattle prods, anything that they could carry. And as the activists crossed over the bridge, they are then going to attack these innocent people and beat many of them um, and, and harm them very severely. And all of this is displayed on the evening news. All the media is there. They catch all of this on TV. You guys will be watching a video next week that shows the actual footage of all of this. But as you can see, the police are gathering these people. You can see this guy's beating this person with a club. They're, um, oh, they also launched tear gas. I forgot to mention they launched tear gas on these people. And then they started to go after them with horses. They were on their horses and started beating these people, people almost to death. Um, as you can see here, and all of this, these images of these people like on the ground helpless is all over the evening news. And so once again, as you can see, as nonviolent protesting continues, it is the um, response and the reaction that you get from the police officers um, that forwards the cause because they are the ones that are looking violent. They are the ones that look like they are in the wrong and they are eventually um, going to be able to enact change because they're showing all they're doing is marching peacefully. Here's another image here. This is known as Bloody Sunday. It becomes known by the media as Bloody Sunday. And so um, once, you know, they turned around, they went back and they regrouped, and King was not present on the march on March 7th, but he called for the march to resume on the 9th, two days later. Within that two days, Thousands of people fled to Selma to participate in the march. They saw what happened on TV, and they knew that they needed to help these people. And so you have people of all different races, of all different religions, um, coming down to help for the cause of these activists. And what ends up happening that day, and Dr. King is a part of it, um, as they go down, they cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They see the police that are standing there. George Wallace is still saying, nope, we are not letting this march happen. It's a disruption to the highway and so forth, and they cannot go march on the highway. In the process of while this is going on, they are trying to get um, it passed by a district judge that it is legal for them to execute their First Amendment rights. However, the court hearing is still going on. And so the day of March 9th, when Dr. King leads these people across the bridge, he ends up, instead of crossing through the picket line and going through that violence, they end up sit down, sitting down and calling a prayer. And after they pray, they turn around and walk back. And this is known as Turnaround Tuesday. A lot of people criticized him for this, but he knew the same thing was going to happen as what happened on Bloody Sunday. And he thought that they just needed to be patient until they had legal jurisdiction to um, complete the march. 
And so you can see people of all different religions come down to Selma to march with Dr. King and the rest of these activists. Thousands of people marched down to Selma. That's why a lot of people criticized um, King for turning around that day because so many people had made the trip down. Now, here you can see they're stopping and praying. And then in this bottom picture here, this is them turning around that day. Now, unfortunately, that evening, um, as you know, you, I said, many other people came down to Selma that evening or that day to try to go in this march. But that evening, you know, after they had turned around, there was a group of um, Christian ministers that was eating at a local restaurant. And as they were leaving the local restaurant, they were jumped by members of the KKK and beaten terribly and severely. One of the men, James Reeb, was beaten so severely um, that he was taken to the hospital and later died with his wife by his side. And he was just a minister who came down in order to um, march with the rest of these activists. So now another person has been killed, and this time it is a white person. And so this really is going to catch the attention of the president. And the president actually is um, supporting Dr. King on this, but is saying he will support whatever the courts say. And the judge finally makes a ruling that on, on March 17th, he ruled that the state of Alabama could not infringe on the First Amendment rights to protest of these people down in Selma. And so George Wallace has to allow these people to march from Selma to Montgomery. And so on March 21st, the march is going to begin. And actually, Johnson federalizes the National Guard, just as Eisenhower did in Little Rock Nine. He federalizes the, uh, the National Guard of Alabama, and these soldiers are going to protect them along the way on their march. And eventually, four days later, they march that 53 miles to get to Montgomery on March 25th. You can see here, the National Guard, instead of hurting them, is going to be protecting the people on this march. And there's where they're crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And so once they finally get to Montgomery, Dr. King makes a speech on their doorstep asking for change and telling Johnson that we need change. And so Johnson is going to make a televised address asking for quick passage of it for a tough voting rights law. And he gives a speech that was very meaningful to the people um, of the civil rights movement. Here's a couple uh, quotes from the speech. At times, history and fate meet to shape a turning point in a man's unending search for freedom. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote. Outside this chamber is the outraged conscience of a nation. And he ends the speech with the words, we shall overcome. And this was meaningful to those people because um, this was actually one of the songs that they would sing on their um, marches and so forth. And so this is a song of the civil rights movement. And he ends that speech like, you know, together, we shall overcome. And he is asking for quick passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is passed with large majorities. Dr. King is there when it is passed, Rosa Parks is there is when it is passed, and it proves to be one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation ever to pass. Yes, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was important, but this allowed um, African Americans that right to vote that they should have gotten with those civil rights amendments that were passed almost a hundred years ago and it prohibits racial discrimination in voting and gives the government the tools to break down long-standing barriers to African American voting rights whether it's federal whether it's state and whether it's local elections and here you can see uh, Dr. King shaking the hand of LBJ there after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 Within three weeks, more than 27,000 in Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana registered to vote. And African-American candidates soon started to be elected um, to state and local offices. And previously, those positions were held by whites who supported segregation. And so we immediately start to see change enacted within these southern states. 
And so the question here asks, how did the Selma March secure the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965? It showed the discrimination uh, that was going on to these African Americans, and it kind of forced the federal government and the president to take action um, in order to help these African Americans secure the right to vote. So that is all we have today. Make sure you fill those notes out um, and turn those in, please. Thank you.